Good morning. I am Scott McGrew. I'm the Public Health Outreach Coordinator for the National Hansen's Disease Program. I want to welcome you to our discussion today about the identification and treatment of Hansen's disease or leprosy. Um, and I want to introduce the speakers we have today. Dr. Mara Dasho is the dermatopathologist of the National Hansen's Disease Program. She has provided expert opinion in the diagnosis of leprosy with the program for the last five years. And also with us is Dr. Barbara Stryeska. She is the Chief Medical Officer of the National Hansen's Disease Program. She has worked with the program for 20 years and in the summer of 2013 and also in 2015, she conducted leprosy workshops in the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and in American territories, Guam, and Samoa. So Dr. Stryeska, welcome this morning. Would you take over on our discussion? Thank you, Scott. Today's objectives, uh, we're gonna discuss how and help you how to identify clinical clues that your patient may have Hansen disease, how to make diagnosis, what to tell patient, because because he, will come with, he or she will come with many questions. Where do I start treatment? Should I refer the patient to infectious disease or I can treat patient by myself? Since many of you have never treated the patients, there is, might be a problem. What and how should I monitor my patients? What to look for? There's any problems down the road. If I don't know what to do, how and who can I contact for help? So let's go over the cases. So your first patient comes to your office and he tells you initially only that he has problem with ulcer on the legs and he cannot heal it himself for the several months. You just look at the patient carefully, not only in his leg, and you notice that patient has no eyebrows and eyelashes. You keep asking more questions and sometimes patient feel offended because they came only with the leg. If you keep asking more questions, he said, oh, by the way, I cannot feel my fingers. Then everything comes to your diagnosis from mycosis fundoides to sever severe atopic dermatitis, deep fungal infection, or maybe a typical mycobacterial infection or even leprosy. And you ask patient, can I do the biopsy? And believe me, not all the patient will say, oh, sure, doctor. So. So you check the patient and you notice that his eyebrows are gone. So you ask the question, when have you lost your eyebrows? Most of the time they will say, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe two years ago. So it's good to ask for any picture. Very often could be driver's license or passport and you can see how they look before. And this is only three years difference in both pictures and the patient looks much older and his face has changed dramatically. Difference, he's 23 on this picture and 21 on this one. We're gonna go over other cases. Oh, continue, excuse me, we are recording. I have to agree for this. So this is 16 years old uh, boy who is seen by school nurse for different reason and because he got in a fight. When he undressed, she noticed there's a big lesion on the left arm with a visible border, but he also had another uh, lesion was on the face and another one is on the abdomen. And they are reddish, they are not hypopigmented, they are reddish, and this is hypopigmented. And then the patient was referred to dermatology for biopsy. When you have patient with established diagnosis, you may look for additional clues, which is, and large greater auricular nerve. And you ask patient to turn head to the side so you can see the nerve on the side of the neck. Some patient will come with very unusual symptoms. The only presentations are wounds on the so-called cool places on the knees and elbows. This patient has also only wounds on the fourth finger and he was very uh, curious why it's happening to uh, him. When asking about his habit, this was his habit of drinking uh, coffee in the morning and holding the cup 
which was hot to a very insensitive hand. The skin lesions often when they're presented in emergency room are associated with systemic symptoms. This patient is also very sick, having fever, joint pain, and pancytopenia. And they, uh, Lepromatous leprosy could be just on the bottom of your differential. This patient, now both uh, have lepromatous leprosy, presents with bullous lesions. But during the interview, he mentioned, oh, by the way, I'm getting treatment for leprosy. When you see patients, ask them if they wear any glasses to remove the glasses, because you may uh, see complete loss of eyebrows and eyelashes. Also check uh, eyes look for the redness for the eye closure. When you examine the patient, in addition to check the nose, and you have to really look carefully because from outside, there is no subtle nose in this gentleman. He's completely normal nose, but he has perforation in the, cart uh, in the part where you have only cartilage. And you have to sometimes stick the uh, cotton tip to see it. So when you're looking to make an accurate diagnosis, choosing the lesion that you're going to biopsy is exceedingly important. You really want to try to find a newer lesion. You're going to want to take a punch biopsy or an excisional biopsy, which is a little bit overkill, but a punch biopsy at least that you're able to get subcutaneous tissue and um, examine the nerves from a cool region and or the leading edge of a lesion. We really don't have any definitive laboratory markers that are going to help you um, in terms of blood work, but there are, um, we can perform what are called slit skin smears, which is a way that we can do a scraping from some of these lesions on the cooler areas of the body to then stain um, with a fight stain and then do a bacterial index so that we can quantify how many organisms there are. And then we also do PCR to identify the, uh, the DNA of the organism as M. leprae, or as we'll discuss later, later M. lepromatosis, which is another, um, uh, uh, there's a, that's another um, organism that can cause leprosy. Um, so those are important things to consider when you see these patients come in and you want to consider getting a biopsy. So our current understanding of leprosy transmission, because this is the question uh, very often patient will ask you, uh, how I get it, when I get it, and why it's happening to me. So we have to, this kind of triangle concept has to have susceptible host who has some genetic defect. We have to have an, uh, environmental factors and reservoir in, United States is armadillo. We don't know what the vector is at this point. And we need the pathogen who survives in these conditions in a wet environment. We know the incubation is prolonged. On average, three to 10, but could be as long as 30 years. 95% is thought to be resistant to infection. And this is around the world. United States, when we have only 200 cases in 300 millions, we are 99.5 resistant to infection. Some cases will show spontaneous self-healing and some patients will know about it, especially from endemic area. And this is why they don't go and look for help. As Mamara mentioned, we don't have any diagnostic techniques and we cannot culture M. Lepre, uh, M. lepromatosis. Let's not simply grow on a Petri dish. And especially for the patients who are endemic area, they know they've seen patients with disabilities and they're afraid even to be checked for the disease. So how the infection happens? First of all, we have to have a contact with bacteria. Susceptible host has to get in contact. We used to ask patients, did you touch, have any contact with armadillos? 90% of our patients don't touch armadillos but they live in the area when armadillos are abandoned, especially in central Florida. And they go ar around on, at night because they're nocturnal uh, <clears throat> animals and they live there. So when we have susceptible host, the disease will look different in different 
patients. Everything depends on your own cellular immunity. The better immunity, the minimal disease. And the disease is difficult to diagnose in tuberculoid portions because this is the spectrum of leprosy described by Ridley and Jopling and ranges from polar tuberculoid disease to lepromatous. The more bacteria, the less cellular immunity. Patient may have antibody that are ineffective for treating or for resolving the uh, leprosy. So when we go to biopsy these patients, this is a, a nice illustration of the histologic spectrum of Hansen's disease going from the polar tuberculoid form of the disease on the very left um, and those more organized um, sarcoidal-like granulomas becoming more and more disorganized as you move along the spectrum all the way through um, lepromatous leprosy where you have disorganized uh, diffuse granulomatous infiltrate with really no evidence of organization. And then we also look at the density of acid fast bacilli. So as Barbara mentioned, as you have more cellular immunity, you're going to mount more inflammatory and more organized response to the organism. So fewer organisms will be present in the tuberculoid form. But as you move along the spectrum with less cellular immunity, more organisms are going to be present. The, um, the, the organization of the, of the granulomas will be less, and again, organisms will be more, um, more dense. We have uh, two different terminologies. WHO came up with the concept of possibacillary disease when we can only see five or less lesions. And very often, uh, this disease presents tuberculoid spectrum of the leprosy. And lesions tend to be asymmetrical, larger with definite age, edge, very often in the center is an aesthetic and rough and scaly because skin appendages are damaged and they are dry because sebaceous uh, glands and <clears throat> are destroyed. So how the patient looks like? All the patients we've seen in our center, this patient came, uh, came from Africa and she has single lesion that was discovered during the checkup for diabetes. This guy is from actually from Texas, and he was self-medicating himself for several months with cortisone uh, creams. The finally, the lesion was progressing, and he uh, asked the dermatologist for the biopsy. This young uh, boy he lives in Arkansas, and mother noticed the rash was going to pediatrician, and finally, like any mother, was trying to solve the problem herself. She was reading said, oh my God, what about this leprosy? Because he was adapted from uh, Central America. And this patient was seen in Colorado and this plaque for several months. And when the doctor wants to biopsy, she said, forget it. And she never show up in his office, went somewhere else. And patient actually was from Cambodia living in Colorado. So again, when you biopsy these tuberculoid lesions, you're gonna see these well-formed granulomas, usually superficial and, um, and deep involvement, perivascular, periadnexal, as well as perineural. And sometimes, and you'll hear this kind of as a buzzword, you'll get these sausage-shaped or linear-shaped uh, aggregates around the, uh, the, the nerve bundles. And so when you see that pattern, the superficial and deep involvement, think about it. Of course, other things that can do this or look just like this um, include sarcoidosis, which look like naked granulomas, and you can get perineural involvement in sarcoidosis. So it can be um, it can be confusing. Again, when you look at these, you may just find one organism. You may find none, and we'll talk about that um, shortly when we talk about PCR. And then um, when we move along the spectrum to borderline lepromatous leprosy, as you can see, the granulomas become, become more and more disorganized, more of a uh, granular or foamy histiocytic um, uh, infiltrate, um, perivascular, again, periappendageal, perineural, but again, more diffuse and just not as discreet. 
and usually more organisms, of course, within histiocytes, some of them can be beaded. Um, looking within the nerves is very, very important. Anytime you see uh, uh, mycobacterial infection, always check the nerves because if you see them in the nerves, that means that it is most likely leprosy. So there are two patients with borderline lepromatous leprosy. This young guy is 23 years old and has the rash for more than a year. And finally, he's seen because he's running fever. This gentleman is from Mississippi and has also borderline lepromatous leprosy and rash for over, over 12 months duration, but he's completely asymptomatic and he thought there's no reason to see anybody. Patients with lepromatous leprosy may present differently. They may present with single nodules. They may present with diffuse lesions or just macular rash, which, which a thought initially is due to reactions after bypass surgery. And this is the farmer from North Louisiana who sees his dermatologist for skin cancer, but never show him the elbows because they didn't hurt. So why to bother my doctor? So the organism M. leprae is a very, um, it's a unique uh, mycobacterial organism because it's, it's an obligate intracellular anaerobe. We think that it is transmitted by nasal secretions. And then again, the nine-banded armadillo in the US and parts of uh, South America uh, reservoir, the, and so um, it is, it's a chronic disease. It causes a lot of different immune responses as we've illustrated. And um, long-term disability can occur in 50% of these patients. So it's not just a disease that occurs, you treat it and it's gone. A lot of people really do have a lot of, um, of disability and uh, the nerve, the nerve uh, issues can last for years and years. Um, and again, the, sorry about that. The other organism that's important to recognize, and this is a little bit more recently described, is an organism called Mycobacterium lepromatosis, which causes the same clinical uh, presentation that we see from M. M. leprae. So we think, though, that the differences are more in the pseudogenes and how it is kind of evolutionarily different um, over time, but it does it does seem to be involved more in the diffuse lepromatous leprosy. You may have heard of leprosy bonita, which is um, where you get the diffuse infiltration and you just kind of the shining faces without obvious um, nodule lesions. Um, the organism we think is, um, again, genetically different, large number of pseudogenes, but the biology is similar to M. leprae. So it's very interesting that um, these, these organisms have diverged over time. It responds to multidrug therapy just like M. leprae. Um, so it's treated the same way. And we have, we think at least um, in the literature that red squirrels in Scotland have been found to be the reservoir for this organism. So there are two patients and if you biopsy both, they will have both millions of bacteria, but patients look different. This gentleman is from Western Pacific for tiny island from Federated State of Micronesia. And this gentleman is from Central America from, and they look differently. You obviously see natural lesions all over uh, his face. He has no eyebrows and no eyelashes. And he actually have only one lesion on the legs. So initially it was thought that this is tuberculoid disease because there's no obvious skin lesions. But if you do, we don't have time maybe to talk about it, about skin smears. When you do the slit skins on the ears, elbows and knees, you can see that even though skin looks normal is loaded with bacilli. And there's the biopsy in those patients. So when we look at the fight for these polar lepromatous cases, as you can tell, it is loaded with uh, red snappers. And um, you're gonna see them within histiocytes, you'll see them within nerves, um, forming these, these um, more nodular kind of aggregates we call globi. You probably heard that as well. Patients with lepromatous leprosy often have delayed the diagnosis. There are two of my patients from South Louisiana. 
And as you see, there's not really much uh, lesions. This gentleman has only something unusual presentation of his nose, but not look like classic leprosy. But you can notice his ears are infiltrated and elongated. This lady actually presented initially with uh, peripheral neuropathy and was treated for idiopathic neuropathy till the rash starts showing up on the face and she was advised not to pick on the lesions. And she was diagnosed by plastic surgeon biopsy from the ear. So they both had symptoms at least for uh, 24 months before diagnosis was established. Another group of patients you may uh, see in the future are the patients who are immunosuppressed. Uh, this is the patient, if you can see on his left arm, uh, he had Wegener's granuloma, he was on dialysis and uh, finally received kidney transplant. So he's taking anti-rejection drugs for over 20 years and then develops rash. So initially patient diagnosed themselves, they think he is this flea bites because he has 10 cats at home, but finally gets a biopsy and up, and up with us. So the patients also, you may see older patients who already are treated for different cancers, patients who uh, uses immunomodulators or biologics with Crohn disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and they might develop later on rash and uh, very often that tested for atypical bacteria, but some of them would end up with leprosy. So um, M. leprae and M. leprematosis have a very unique affinity for cutaneous nerves that makes them, sets them apart from other mycobacterial infections. Um, so when you're looking at these, uh, these fight stains and you do see, again, I'm hammer, hammering this in because it is so important. If you see organisms within the nerve, um, we really do think that is pathognomonic and much more specific for diagnosing leprosy um, than any other test that we could have. So it's kind of our gold standard. And so we come to the question of management of these patients. It really is important to understand that this is a very comprehensive approach to treating them. It is not just a skin disease. You can't oversimplify the treatment for these patients. Um, because it is, it's from diagnosis to treating them effectively and managing them. The treatment and the management can last for years because the sequelae can last for years. The treatment is going to include not just prescription medications, but also nerve assessment periodically, referral to occupational physical therapy and monitoring of these patients, and also social services and counseling because there is a very strong stigma associated with this disease that has been historic, but also is, um, it occurs today and is ongoing. So how we treat uh, patients with leprosy? So the standard treatment regimen in the United States that was started over 40 years ago has not changed. Over in the 80s, uh, this was established back in our mother institution in Carville that the best treatment will be using for multibacillary lepromatous uh, cases, daily rifampin, daily dapson, and daily clofazamine. For patients with tuberculoid or posibacillary disease, we're gonna use two drugs, rifampin and dapson. WHO uh, regimen differed and by using rifampin only once a month, and only for one year, and posibacillary disease was treated only for six months and only with once a month rifampin. WHO recently proposes new regimen. The new regimen is called uniform multidrug therapy. So the length of treatment is, uh, remains the same. Posibacillary will be treated for six months. However, they want to use three drugs. So instead of two different packages, WHO will be distributing one kind of package and the difference will be in the length of treatment. So in summary, it will look like this, six months and 12 months. So still monthly rifampin, monthly rifampin, dapson, dapson, clofazamine. The only difference is length of treatment. Reason for this is because when you don't do biopsy and you have one lesion, Sometimes you don't know if it's a or possibacillary disease. 
with this uh, recommendation, 50% of physicians do not agree and don't think uh, patients with minimal disease should be sub, uh, submitted to treatment with clofazim. Why is, why? So there are the patients who are actually treated with clofazim in daily. This is how they look. Imagine a young woman with a facial lesion. This guy is truck driver and uh, this, the pigment lodged in his skin for over five years. And he has these lesions for five years. Imagine this, if people don't have, cannot have such a life also, or, or has to wear long sleeves, etc. And this is one of my patients, the same patient you saw advanced disease, and it was over 10 years ago. So he uses daily clofazamine with rifampin and dapson for 24 months. And after 24 months, I told him, okay, there's enough antibiotic. But he said, doctor, I'm not better. I'm actually worse. And I would agree with him. He looks worse. So we are looking for alternative treatment and actually those alternative antibiotics are listed on our website. You can use this, this or that. It's from quinolones is aflaxacin, one of the first one, and maxiflaxacin, the most potent. For macrolides, only clarithromycin, Zitromax is not working, FM tetracyclines, minocycline. But how you use those uh, antibiotics? Daily, how often and how long? The monthly regimen of consisting of rifampin, of laxis, and immunocycline was published over 20 years ago, and it's on the WHO website. You can use the one ROM for single lesion leprosy. However, there was another paper that you can replace of laxacin with maxiflaxacin and use on a monthly doses. So instead of daily doses, especially in patients who have drug-drug interactions, the elderly taking already seven or eight medications, if you ask them to take daily three antibiotic, the compliance could be difficult. The same with younger patients who don't have time to do it, or they don't remember, or they're lo losing medications. But if you can have supervised a dosing by FaceTime, by uh, Facebook messengers, because sometimes they don't have phones, there is much better compliance. So I used this regimen over 50 patients, and this is one of my patients. He's 21 years old. Initially, he refused uh, to be treated. He doesn't want to take pills, but we negotiated with him just once a month. When he came back six months later, this is his uh, face. And he's back uh, at his job in McDonald's, happy, drinking again. Because another problem is we ask people don't to drink, and it's hard to enforce. I recommend this regimen to other colleagues and they were so surprised and they're sending me actually proof how well it works. So another patient from Pacific with advanced leprosy and this is his ear six months later and you don't see hyperpigmentation, stigmatizing. On the insert of clofazamine, you have warning may cause suicide. It's not antibiotic for suicide, it's the look and patients are so disgusted it's looking bad. And this is another patient, uh, and this is 10 months later on monthly doses of RMM. This is his initial presentation with the lesions, and he already is in reaction. He has uh, mild food drop, he has congestion and sinuses, and 10 months later, he's completely asymptomatic. So, what is the take home message? So, Really, this is a disease of the nerves. It is of the skin, but infection of nerves is, is the hallmark. And so when you're, when you're evaluating these patients, doing a good nerve exam and examining them for hypoesthetic or anesthetic skin lesions and understanding how to do that is very crucial to um, arriving at the right diagnosis and then also getting them hooked into the right uh, resources. These patients can have severe neuropathy in the hands and feet, as you see in those previous illustrations, um, that uh, injury can occur very easily. And so a lot of the, the injuries that we see, the ulcers that we see on the hands and these, these, pressure, these pressure sores are just because these patients cannot feel anything. The corneas become affected, they can become scarred, they can, they can become blinded um, and Again, just very importantly, the biopsy is going to show acid fast bacilli within 
nerve. So keep that in your in the back of your mind. Um, the nerve infiltration of acid fast bacilli is, is illustrated here. It can be very hard to see. You really do sometimes have to go down to um, more than 40X. I uh, very often I'll have to go down to oil um, on these cases. If you have a strong suspicion, you really just take a couple of extra minutes to look. Um, it makes a big difference because that's where the money is. That the money is gonna be in the nerves if you're gonna find, um, if you see this kind of perineural inflammation with granulomas, that's where it's gonna be. So we're talking about the nerve, the nerves and nerves and nerves. This bacillus has affinity to Schwann cells and is usually slow infection, slow progress. However, the nerve damage may happen before diagnosis is established during the treatment or even after the treatment. So this patient finished treatment for lepromatous leprosy and two years after finishing the treatment, he told me, I cannot play guitar. So we did the video visit and he came to us and this is how our orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Matthew, asked him simple test. And then when you have any doubt, uh, also on your new patient, you ask the patient to do this. And the patient can do this, his ulnar nerve is so weak that the fifth finger goes up. When it's more weakness, you can see fourth and fifth finger slightly elevated. If you don't see elevation, you always can test the strength, just pushing at the base of the fifth finger. It gives you only assessment of the strength. But this is a three seconds evaluation in your office. I want to show you uh, how the patient look like before we have treatment. So this patient has anesthetic fingers and, and why he lost his fingers? Because of the constant injury osteomyelitis was not due to M. lepre. It was due to staph infection. And because it was asymptomatic means painless, he didn't really care, but you can see the nails. And there's also self-absorption of the bones, not only from the trauma, also from the anesthetic nerves. And uh, one of the patients who already passed away, meanwhile, is the patient who actually have no fingers at all and imagine the life that those people have. They couldn't hold caps. They were spilling the food and actually were eating just from the plate because the hands were not really functioning at all. The same with hygiene, etc. This is why we have leprosoriums that those patients were taken care of. So corneal nerves can also be affected by, uh, by leprosy. And when you have the infiltration of the nerves, losing sensation, chronic trauma then to the corneas, you get this ulceration and scarring of the corneas. Um, the first sign of, of uh, eye involvement might be uveitis, so it might be painful, um, but then the corneas become anesthetic and then with chronic trauma, dryness, et cetera, they become scarred down and then blindness would ensue. So eye examination is, ever, is very important to repeat this uh, during the, each visit. And the question you have to ask is close your eyes. And when patients close your eyes, you can see lack of thalamus. And if the patient has minimal uh, gap, you can ask close your eyes tightly. When people close eye tightly, then you can even pull the eyelids and you can see they cannot hold it. So I examination, I'm not talking about examination, I'm just talking about testing. And this is the question you ask patient, close your eyes, please. So how are we gonna monitor these patients once we've actually, we've actually ac accomplished the diagnosis and we started them on treatment? Well, we're going to want to uh, follow them regularly and do a good physical exam with nerve testing. Um, assessing their, their, their sensory function, but then they're also the ocular and the motor. Um, performing labs every three months is important, especially um, to monitor for reactions, but while they're on the medication, especially as the ones that can cause um, systemic issues and lab abnormalities, sometimes a rebiopsy is indicated. That does happen a lot during 
the, the course of management and as patients are going through the process, just because they may be having improvement, but they may also be having worsening of the lesions. And there's a concern that on the clinician's end, is this patient not responding? Is the patient resistant to the medication I'm giving them? Or are they in a reaction? And so a biopsy can be so informative. Uh, I'm so sorry. It can be so informative to uh, ensure that you're on the right track, but also in monitoring the progress um, and any reactions that come up. Making sure again, that they are hooked into the right PT, OT um, specialists, and then having them do baseline uh, eye exam with pressure and slit lamp um, while they're on potentially long-term corticosteroids for reactions, but also an in-eye office eye exam is easy. We don't do it so much in term, but it's obviously something that if you were to see a lot of these patients, it's easy enough to do um, a quick eye exam, especially for motor function. Like Barbara said, close your eyes, easy enough to do. So how often, uh, this is the question a uh, patient will ask you, so when I will get better? As we mentioned, this is chronic disease. It develops over years. So expectation for the patient is I'm taking the pills every day for the first month and I don't see any difference. The difference will be seen after a few years, not right away. So this is the patient who was taking classic treatment with clofazamine, dapson, and rifampin from 2009. And I was taking picture every year. On this uh, second picture, I noticed that his eyebrows are maybe falling apart or something is going on. So I asked what happened? Oh, I just shaved it. This is very fashionable. So you could be just confused with this. If you see the hyperpigmentation here is from clofazamine, the more bacilli, the more darker lesions. Clofazamine lodges in bacterial wall of the bacilli. Clofazamine is a lipophilic drug, similarly like minocycline, and actually we are tattooing the lesions. Even we have not seen them before, now we can see them better. So when we stop the treatment after three years, he's not getting better. He has to use uh, steroids, so he gains some weight, but the pigmentation remains. And finally, is a couple of years later, you can still see the pigment. It's not so easy to, uh, the pigment to disappear from the patient faces. So what we can also do with these biopsies um, is to monitor the resolution of, of, of the disease. And so we do that by assessing the density of organisms, the density of the inflammatory infiltrate, um, and then also the morphology of the organisms, because over time, the organisms go from a, uh, an, an intact rod to a more granular or beaded-like um, appearance, and eventually they become almost like just pieces of sand. And so you just sometimes see a very faint um, bit of, of, of red staining with the fight stains. But we want to watch over the, over the course of time that the organisms are disappearing from the tissues, but keep in mind that the organisms stay in the tissues for decades, especially if this is a patient that has a large bacterial load. So um, this can take a long time and is not uncommon that PCR is still positive after years, even though the organism is dead and there's nothing viable in the tissues. So this is five years later and you can see that just a few organisms are left, but the inflammatory infiltrate is still there and you still can see, you can see enough to call it positive. So just a summary for this part of our lecture of uncomplicated Hansen's disease, keep in mind, this is a very chronic, slow, um, disease that can start slowly and then it can progress over time. The patients really a lot of times are not concerned by it because they're asymptomatic. Um, and so they just have a rash. And so they may just present with a, a one lesion, but it doesn't bother them. Even if they have billions of organisms in their tissues, they may not even know it. Um, the infection responds very well to appropriate um, antimicrobacterial treatment antibiotics, but it's a slow process. That's why we treat them for one to two years at a time. Um, it can be cured 
And unfortunately, this disease still occurs in countries where there is still um, poor access to medications, but it is curable and, um, and us identifying them clinically is so important to giving them those resources. And keeping in mind long-term disability and stigma are so crucial for these patients as they move forward um, with their treatment, because this is a disease that no one wants to have for so many reasons. And so it's our job to just make it a little bit more, um, more of a palatable experience for our patients and show them that there is hope for them. And so this is just a little bit about us. Um, and the services that we provide at the NHTP um, diagnosis, so confirmation, histology, providing biopsy kits, we can guide you through the process. Um, testing, every block that we receive now is tested for PCR. We perform M. leprae and M. lepromatosis uh, DNA uh, genotyping and PCR studies, so we can identify the organism. We can do tele and video consultations, Barbara can tell you all about that, especially remote with remote access um, so prominent now and so universal. It's easier for us to do that. And then we can also house patients at our at our program. We do have patient rooms, um, and we're able to to care for these patients at no cost to the patient, um, and refer them for PT, OT, and even hand surgery if indicated. We also have a basic science program and laboratory. We do a lot of basic science work um, and genetic work. And so there's a lot of really interesting things going on, including an armadillo lab as part of LSU. So um, very exciting. And uh, in case you need to reach us, uh, we have phone number has not changed in uh, 40 years <laughs> and our emails and you can Google us and you're gonna find us. So uh, I think we can have five minutes for the questions. Uh, during this time, I'm gonna download the uh, next lecture. So we open for questions, if any. Many people in the world get leprosy. Yeah. I wonder if it's easier to put the questions in the chat. Okay. I'm gonna try that instead. Scott, if you can come over and change uh, the next um, lecture, make sure it's in the right, pl right place. A uh, question, uh, what is the average turnaround time for PCR? It's approximately two weeks. And we need the paraffin embedded um, uh, tissue or you can send fresh tissue. Hi, can you hear us all right? Yes. So two weeks, that's great. I mean, even the pre-COVID, I felt like my experience with that had been a lot longer than two weeks, um, sometimes up to three months. And so is just something changed that you guys are able to process them more quickly or? Well, I mean, <laughs> at this point, it's two weeks. We do have a backlog because COVID happened and the program shut down. But then also um, uh, the laboratory moved, and we didn't have um, we didn't have our, our resources, and so there is a, currently a backlog for histology processing. But the PCR turnaround is still about two to three weeks. So that's still now that everything's online, that's what it should be on average. The histologic turnaround is the for pathology reports is much longer. And we are recording the lecture and uh, whoever wants to have the lecture, Scott would distribute to them because there was the question. So I'm um, answering also to everybody. So um, I had a question. So 
We have a few questions from the group. Um, for like a complicated disease, which you guys went over in the last presentation, is there any utility for doing PGL-1 antibody testing or is there? I don't know what lab can do it. Can... No. This is still in the research. <laughs> In Brazil, they're oh, doing uh, uh, PGL1, but only you can pick up lepromatous cases. The problem was with tuberculoid cases, not enough antibodies. Thank you. I have a question on the slit skin exams. Is that, is, can you just elaborate a little bit more about what that is? And is that something that we should be doing clinically or it's something like histologically? Mara, can you open? Can you answer? Yeah, I mean, I think the the skin slit smears are at this point they're used more for monitoring and not as much for diagnostic. Um, at least here, where we have the ability to do biopsies and send in the tissue and have it um, it read by a pathologist and then arrive at the diagnosis. Um, so for diagnostic purposes, not so much, but there are programs that still use it to assess, um, to assess progress and to make sure that the bacterial index is going down and not up. Um, it's, it's very rare to have to, for leprosy to, to relapse after successful complete treatment. It's very, very rare. So if there is a concern for relapse, a lot of times that's just a reaction and we'll get into that now. This is a very good question because the problem is, has to be repetitive. If we have two different technicians, everybody have a little bit different techniques because we have uh, this situation in our lab and two different technicians have two different uh, results. One goes a little bit deeper, one sup too superficially. And yet you compare apple to oranges. So first of all, you have to have good trained technician and you can do it. And the reason to do it, as Mara said, is once a year, because we would like to go, uh, see it going by one point. And the relapse was defined uh, in the past that skin smears are plus two in all sites. Because the question always coming, you know, what is relapse, not reaction. But then you have to prove it that skin smear has to be plus to more than initial uh, level. Okay, so for the next- yeah. Hi. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, one last question. Just from like a logistical standpoint, because they don't have these things in like books. Like, how, like what is the process of collecting a, a skin split smear? Like you, you said you scraped it, but then is it transported like in an envelope? Like you would okay. do a, have... a special temperature thing or is it put the formalin? We uh, have very good uh, video how to do it, okay? So if somebody needs to uh, know how to do it, we have video with instructions for our technician. Uh, she recorded this. You just air dry uh, slides and send to us and make sure uh, you have uh, put the site. And each time you have to use new blade. Uh, one, each site has new blades so you don't contaminate. But uh, we have excellent video and uh, can be uh, sent to whoever wants to do it and, uh, and practice on somebody first. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so our next, the next uh, second half of our, of our lecture series, we're gonna talk about more of the complicated uh, sequelae of leprosy. How are we gonna manage these immunological reactions which many times occur um, and some, some patients even present in reactions. Hold on. So here are our objective, objectives. We're gonna talk about what is a reaction? How are you going to know that it's a reaction? How do you treat it? And what, if any, are any long-term sequelae to be aware of? And so, and trying to answer the first question, what is a leprosy reaction? It is complicated, but we believe it's an increased immune response to the antigen, uh, the bacterial antigenic material. It is not a failure of antibiotics. It is not resistance to the antibiotics. It is not a toxicity or a true drug allergy. And that's really important because a lot of patients believe that they're having an allergic response to their antibiotics and will stop it. 
patients often present in reaction to the ER and they'll show up without leprosy even being diagnosed. So even if you're not on treatment, um, even if the patient is not being treated, they can still have a reaction because the immune system is still responding to the, um, the antigenic material. So it's a very confusing situation, but it's not treatment dependent. Um, and then um, Hansen's is diagnosed um, and then the patient eventually gets on treatment. But a lot of times it's a winding road for these people. So we look at the types of reactions. There are several types to keep in mind. Um, the first to go over is one called a reversal reaction or type one reaction. You may have heard about, about this. Typically we see it in borderline leprosy, typically in the case of the more tuberculoid end of the spectrum. So that's it, just as a refresher, these are patients who have organized granulomas, fewer organisms and are mounting a greater um, immunologic response. The second type is one called ENL or erythema nodosum leprosum, type two reaction. We think that this is an immune complex disorder in more of the lepromatous end of the spectrum and typically the borderline patients. So borderline is almost like they're kind of moving in between the, the different poles um, and they're more susceptible to, to reactions. Neuritis is a, is a hallmark of these reactions. Patients can have neuropathy just from leprosy, just from the disease and infiltration of the nerves by the organism, but neuritis can occur just because nerve function will worsen without any other symptoms of a reaction sometimes. So that's something to also keep in mind, a patient who's on treatment and then all of a sudden develops worsening um, neuropathy or neuritis. And then Lucio's is, um, is the last form of reaction to talk about. It is a more, um, it, it's certainly a, a serious complication, um, a thrombotic complication where patients um, develop uh, these, these fibrin thrombi within vessels um, and can have necrosis and ischemia. So it's gonna be very, very serious and on sometimes deadly. Type one reactions um, can occur at any point during treatment course. And we unfortunately don't have any really good histologic criteria for reactions. So a lot of this is clinical, whether you see worsening of existing skin lesions or worsening neuritis. Um, this patient had uh, paralysis or foot drop. This is a historic picture from 50 years ago, but paralysis or foot drop. And that was really the, the, the thing that she presented with. And then ultimately a biopsy was performed, but was nonspecific. So it wasn't as helpful. Um, so clinical was extremely important in making this diagnosis. When we look again at the spectrum of Hansen's disease um, and we look at where reactions fall in that spectrum, if you recall where cellular immunity is high in the tuberculoid form of, of leprosy, you can develop the type one reactions more readily, but as that cellular immunity falls, as organisms become, become more abundant, um, type two reactions are more prominent or more common, but there's importantly, as you can tell in this diagram, there is overlap. So there may be some patients who have both features of a type one and type type two reactions. So it can be very challenging. So this is the patient who was diagnosed actually in Florida and was started on the treatment. And he was told he may have reaction, but three months later, he looks like this. In addition to his running fever and nothing really works. He even was placed on steroids, but not high enough. And this is why the, after Googling, uh, he came to us. And this is why I have this picture. Uh, we didn't talk much about another form of leprosy, which is relatively uh, uh, rare in the United States, but in other countries like India and Brazil uh, is seen more often. So this is a 15 years old girl who is complaining of elbow pain, non-specific elbow pain, takes Tylenol, uh, is rather ignored. He gets pregnant and after uh, she delivered the baby said, no, but now my really elbow is hurting. I cannot take uh, pick uh, my child. So she was finally referred to orthopedic surgeon who noticed 
atrophy of the right hand and clawing on the fifth finger. So he said, this might be some compression of the ulnar nerve. So he explored uh, a nerve and he found a thickened ulnar nerve. And after serial of biopsies, we found one fragmented uh, uh, bacillus. So this is isolated, pure neural leprosy, no skin lesion, and it's only involvement in one nerve. So type one reactions are also called reversal reactions. Um, it's a delayed type four hypersensitivity um, mechanism. We think again, shift of cell mediated immunity toward the tubercular disease or upgrading. So that's a little bit of a confusing term, but the immunity is going in the tuberculoid end of the spectrum. And so it's upgrading because the, the, the immune response is becoming more robust. It occurs in the borderline uh, forms of the, of, the, of the disease and the, the spectrum of the borderline cases that are tuberculoid, mid-borderline or BB, as well as, as borderline lepromatous. So diagnosis of reversal reaction uh, could be tricky because we tell patient initially, you may get worse with treatment. So people ask, so how much worse? Now, whatever is gone may reappear again. And this is why the people think, ah, I think I have relapsed, nothing is working. So this is worsening of existing lesions. They may have more edema and more erythema. Patient don't really know much about the nerves. They would say, I have pain, I cannot walk, I cannot pick up uh, objects. I'm hurting at night in my hands. And some patients will present with swelling of the hands and feet and could be up to the knee level. So this is my patient, 81 years old uh, gentleman who has BL disease. And he started the treatment, nothing is going on. He's improving till 12 months later, he comes for follow-up and says, doctor, I cannot drive my car. And he has a foot drop when I said, can you undress? So you see almost the same lesions are now easily visible with redness and swelling. So how does swelling of extremities present? So this is under challenging cases. This is the patient who is 89 years old, living in Louisiana with diabetic neuropathy. And he has rash, which didn't bother him for years. And now when diagnosis was established uh, and started on antibiotic, uh, he comes three months later, said, doctor, I cannot walk. When he took off his shoes and socks, I said, so there's so much edema. So now you have dilemma because you have elderly patient who is diabetic and you have to treat him. So we brushed on type one reactions and the fact that we really don't know how and why they occur. However, we think that again, borderline, the borderline cases are more likely to develop um, these, these reactions. And we think that it's again, an enhanced cellular immune response. Um, and so we're upgrading. So we're going from more less disorganization to more disorgan to more organization and more of a robust um, cellular immune response. There is a thought that the CD4 T cells, uh, CD1 dendritic cells, and the Th1 cytokines are involved in the process. And um, some authors have measured CXCL10 in these uh, type 1 reactions and found, them to, found it to be increased. So potentially a, a marker. But again, we don't have criteria. So it's clinical. And then um, histologically, just because this comes up a lot, the, the biopsies really are not terribly informative. But there may be some soft signs that there might be some increased organization or an enhanced cellular immune response. So sometimes I'll see um, more, uh, more multinucleated giant cells than usual. Sometimes there's more edema, um, interstitial edema. Sometimes there's more of a lymphocytic infiltrate, but these are very soft signs. And a lot of it comes down to the entire picture, the clinical pathologic correlation. Sometimes we see these type one reactions also as an immune reconstitution reaction. So with patients who are immune suppressed, but then they are, for whatever reason, their immune system um, becomes more robust 
and then we see them go into a reaction. So it's possible that some of these patients who are immune suppressed might develop a reaction once their immune system sort of um, responds or is able to rebound. So how we treat the reactions? The reversal reactions, uh, we have to use anti-inflammatory drugs. So you find in the textbook, you use steroids and the dose could be high, sometimes uh, even one milligram per kilogram, but it depends on the patient because when you have facial lesion, you'll be more aggressive because you uh, worry about facial nerve paralysis. You have elderly patient with diabetes, you, go, you will not go with higher doses. So uh, consider early steroid sparing medication. There is no textbook which one is the best. Now there are more papers about using methotrexate early. Don't wait, start the methotrexate early to spare people from high doses of steroids. And unfortunately, Switch the, the reaction... Switch the can slide. You hear me? Yeah, just click the slide. It looks like we're not on the next page yet. Okay, so I see something I'm happening sure everyone here. Sees it. Yeah, okay. There we go. Sorry. No. Yeah, thank you. So um, continue uh, slow taper and reaction may last from six to 12 months. So the lowest dose of prednisone, the better. Otherwise people get in trouble. And high dose of uh, clofazimine was tried. It's not the best, but sometimes the only thing may work. I use this uh, solution only on two patients in over my 600 patients, but I have to put in writing. So I, I show you my patient who, actually there was the picture from the uh, ER physician, but we were tracing the case. So he comes, uh, he's 20 years old, goes to emergency room because his uh, face is hurting him and he is very red. And he gives the story. He initially goes and gets a uh, cortisone injection and asks to come back in a couple of days. He goes back again, faces red again. So he's examined more next time. And uh, they can see small perforation in the nose. Then he said, oh, by the way, I have some lesions on my back. So he get biopsies, uh, bacilli is uh, seen, and he was referred to us because there was the problem. So I started him on high dose steroids because I see his facial involvement. I start him on one milligram uh, per kilogram. One week later, he looks like this. I don't have a picture when he's asking, say cheese, because he had uh, a facial nerve paralysis. But during the examination, I noticed when I look at his eyes, you can see actually right here is a central scar. And this is opacity because he was itching and doing just this. And on insensitive cornea, you have damage and actually has those uh, scars in both uh, corneas. And I kept him on high dose steroids because the facial lesion and, and the eye, and six months later, I look at his eyes, the scar was gone. I think because he was so young, uh, he was able to remodel um, the cornea. And I talked to other ophthalmologists, I said, it's almost impossible, but in medicine, impossible things happen. So I was so uh, satisfied that he was able uh, to see again well, because it was in both eyes and central. Unfortunately, high dose steroids came with the price and he has stretch mark all over his body. So we see leprosy in children. And this is another picture of the child who was seen at school and referred appropriately to the doctor. And, uh, and you have started the treatment. He doesn't want to go to school. So we negotiate how we're gonna be treated with what. And he was eventually placed on a low dose methotrexate and uh, low dose prednisone, no more than uh, five milligrams daily, then cut to 2.5. And this is how he looked uh, a couple months later. So he has resolution of the lesion, but you will see some post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. So going back to the patients who have, who have a problem with uh, facial lesions. So as I mentioned, I asked this patient if I can record her face and she said, okay. So I recorded the, the magic question, close your eyes.
So this is the story of the patient. I got phone call from um, ID physician in Colorado. They, they have a patient and they think it could be leprosy. They did biopsy and it's, they couldn't find bacilli. And she sent me the picture and I noticed the slight opening on the eyelids uh, right here on the right side. So I decided, you know, this patient, I think could be, uh, have problems. I think it would be better if we, she come to us. And she came with her son because she said she couldn't speak English and patient from, from INR. When she arrived to us, she already was treated in Colorado with uh, minocycline twice a day and Dapson because they couldn't get clofazamine. When I was talking to the patient, I asked her, did you ever take any medications, any medication? And she said, oh, I came with my medication. And she, she showed me blister packs because she was given in uh, Myanmar blister packs with clofazamine. So what you saw on the uh, hyperpigmentation initially, it was from clofazamine, but nobody asked maybe appropriate question or she didn't want to tell. So then she comes to us and she looks like this. And she said she has lack of thalamus, she has paralysis on the right side of the face and, and foot drop. So after the talking to the son, uh, as a translator, I asked her, if, I, if, you have, if I can fulfill your one wish, what would it be? And she didn't worry about her lack of thalamus or the foot drop. Her wish was, I want to look better. So, I was magician and one day I put the makeup on her said see you look better so I didn't cure her but I make her better and she's smiling she can go outside so this was solution number one offer people makeup I bought her cheap makeup and we practice uh, in the examining room how to do it and she was practicing more and this was a couple of days later she was so good at this so I changed the treatment I said don't take those pills those pills we're gonna use clarithromycin and Dapson and once a month rifampin. I also put, uh, placed her on methotrexate, a steroid sparing and moderate dose of prednisone because she already uh, was taking high dose and felt very sick. And she came six months later for follow-up and she said, doctor, I didn't put my makeup. Look at me. I said, okay, what about your face? Can, you, can we record your face? Sure, and, and we did. Can you close your eyes? So she improved not only the closure of the eyelids, but also the problem with facial nerve paralysis. So after a couple months of treatment with uh, not uh, medication caused hyperpigmentation, she was able to close her eyes completely and her foot drop improved. Uh, she didn't have to wear, uh, wear the brace. So the treatment, we think antibiotic, antibiotic. We have to address inflammation. We have to treat it better and earlier to prevent disability. Very often nerve injury is not recognized well. So we're gonna move to uh, next type of reactions. And Barbara, don't you sometimes start these patients um, while you, when you start multidrug therapy, you also start them on immunosuppressive therapy at the same time? Yeah, I think we all starting too late. We have to start with uh, immuno, I, I wouldn't say immunosuppression. I would, I would rather use immunomodulation okay. to decrease this anti-inflammatory treatment as immunomodulation and then use antibiotics because Patients always think is antibiotic causing them their reactions and they don't want to take it. Maybe they are right. We think they don't because we see reactions before the treatment, but uh, I don't think we have all the answers yet. Right. So moving on to um, erythema and adosomoprosin, this is a type two reaction. We covered type one. Ty um, ENL is a, also an immunologic reaction in which painful inflammatory um, symptoms and sequelae occur during um, usually 50% of uh, lepromatous Hansen's patients will get it during treatment, but it can occur before treatment as well, just like type 1 reactions. It can cause significant hardship for patients. Patients are very sick um, who, who present with type 2 reactions typically because it's more of a systemic um, uh, cytokine related uh, uh, reaction. 
And also because of the high doses of steroids, a lot of patients develop adrenal insufficiency. And so we have all of these other sequelae that occur. We don't really understand light type one. We don't exa understand exactly the pathophysiology of ENL, but we think it has to do with neutrophil um, recruitment, immune complex deposition, T cell involvement and increased TNF alpha and other cytokines um, that ultimately play a role in the, uh, the, the histologic features, but also the clinical features that we see. So these patients can be mild to moderate. They can come with just a few lesions that are not very tender. They might just be a little bit tired. Um, certainly monitor their inflammatory markers, but they can also come in with severe, uh, severe findings where they have painful subcutaneous nodules, ulcerations, high fever, high white count, anemia and organ involvement. So including orchitis and iritis. So other organs can be involved. These patients are typically very, very sick and they'll go to the ER and they'll show up and without knowing what, that if the patient has leprosy or not, obviously you can see how things could be very complicated. Well, there are uh, patients who may present with different kind of symptoms. The slide here is from a leprosy atlas uh, on Filipino patients who comes to the clinic after having uh, problems for several uh, days to weeks. This patient uh, finished the treatment but has ongoing uh, ENL for three years and he is using prednisone on his own because he thinks he knows what to do, but he, when he runs out, uh, suddenly he develops ulceration. This uh, young boy, I remember them well, the patients uh, initially was treated for TB. And finally he sees physician uh, who actually is from South America. I said, this is not TB, this is leprosy, you have reaction. So the more you know, it will be easier to diagnose. And this patient is my patient who also finished the treatment, two years of treatment, and a year later is coming back. Hey doc, is coming back. My, I think that my leprosy is coming back because this is on his mind. The leprosy is coming back. So I said, we're going to do the biopsy. I want to prove it to you. It's not leprosy. It's your body reacting to the dead bacteria because patient, even they trust you, they still, some, they want to be uh, sure, make sure it's not coming back. So this is why you do the biopsy. You can see less bacilli. And important, if you can do the biopsy from initial site, not exactly when you see the big nodule, but compare initial biopsy because the bacilli are not evenly distributed. So if you have from the arm and you compare with the leg, there will be there might be a difference. We will also receive biopsies just to rule out or rule in a reaction. So when we look at the histologic features of type 2 reactions, the hallmark is going to be diffuse background, histiocytic infiltrate, um, often foamy, because remember, this is the laser, typically the lepromatous patients, and they don't have organized, um, nice epithelioid granulomas, they're going to have more disorganized foamy histiocytes, but you're going to look for neutrophils. Neutrophils in this setting of lepromatous leprosy is going to be ENL. Um, and then often we will see some evidence of vascular damage, sometimes some vasculitis, um, but this type of, of reaction, we don't see fibrin thrombi. We'll get to that next, but this is really what you're looking for in the ENL um, picture. Uh, lots of organisms. So you do a fight stain and you're gonna see lots of organisms. So this could look like any other atypical mycobacterial infection. Um, so that's certainly something to consider is other mycobacterial infections. But remember, when you see the organisms in a nerve in this setting, it's going to be leprosy in reaction. And then the pathway of, and we're kind of talking about the pathophysiology of ENL. We think that toll-like receptor two plays a role in the initiation of the cascade. And then several cytokines play a role, IL-1 beta, IFN gamma. And then again, remember E-selectin with, um, uh, is an adhesion, adhesion cytokine that causes these neutrophils to migrate 
Um, and then again, you're gonna see that in the infiltrate histologically. So immune complex deposition does play a role. Um, T cells play a role. And then again, these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which we're still learning about this, uh, this cascade, um, but it is something like this, ultimately leading to neutrophil recruitment. This is my patient, uh, and uh, this is the picture I received from an ER physician who said, you know, I saw this guy two days ago, I gave him antibiotic for cellulitis, and then comes two days later, it's worse, and then he's telling me to call you because uh, he's taking treatment for leprosy. So I said, okay, so I'll give him uh, IV steroids if you want to admit him. No, 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 I I'm going to admit him, ID will take care of this. So I said, let's, let's do the IV steroids and we're gonna bring him acutely to uh, Baton Rouge because I have to change the uh, way of treatment. So uh, it took us of about 72 hours and he comes, he looks like this. So I haven't seen abscess who heal so quickly on steroids. They use Vanco just in case because nobody believed me. And then we're negotiating what to do. So we're talking about high dose clofazamine, talamid, but you have to use condoms. Oh, forget it, condoms. So, okay, let's do the uh, prednisone and clofazamine. But uh, people feel great. So if they run out, they're not worried because they're doing well till they run out. And a week later, we have again, ulcerations, new nodules and the pain. And pain is everywhere. People feel like, I feel like it was a ton of brick. This is this description. And this patient who is very advanced, but you can see your ears almost looks normal, but has nodules all over the face. Not as much on his body, it was on his face. And he finally agreed for high dose clofazim in Talomid. And when he is well, he's healed. You know, there is no signs of scar, but the hyperpigmentation lasted uh, for a couple of years. My next patient, uh, <laughs> had episode orchitis. And uh, each time I asked, do you have any swollen testicles? Nah, nah. But I don't think he wants to admit it because after a couple of years, when he finished the treatment and it was no more problems reaction, I checked his testosterone. He always denied episodes, but he developed gynecomastia. So this is something you may see in patients uh, long time after the treatment, and you have to ask for orchitis because I haven't seen patients who would just tell you, oh, by the way, doctor, my boss, can you examine me? So we have to ask, but if they uh, tell you the problem, you tell them what to do, how to do it, call me immediately, because if they have orchitis, you have to use high dose of steroids for one or two days. I give them one milligram per kilogram. There is indication for high dose of steroids. Otherwise they have ischemic events in, in testicles and they end up with initially erectile dysfunction and they end up with gynecomastia eventually. So how we treat? So I hate steroids, but they are miracle drugs. So I use them to abate the symptoms because the drug of choice is thalamid. Thalidomide is severely restricted. So you cannot get it immediately. It would take a, at least 10 days. I know because I know how to apply and still it takes me one week to 10 days. When we have sick patients, you have high dose of steroids, even IV, and um, patients are well in 20 or 48 hours. And then you have to use something to use uh, on a long uh, time. And I use talomid early. I don't wait uh, and I don't use steroids because this is the trap. People become steroid dependent and um, getting referral patients who are already five years of steroids and you cannot discontinue because they break in the nodules. Clofazamine uh, is effective, but takes time. It's not completely only clofazamine. You have to use with steroids. And the reason is you use clofazamine for a longer period of time and you slowly withdraw steroids. Some patients will need talomid, clofazamine, steroids, and methotrexate if they are sick enough. So this is the, come the art. If you see more patients, you will feel what to use. But if you use talomid early enough, hope you can avoid the severe uh, consequences. I put this uh, slide about clofazamine because it's restricted in the United States. So we have to become clofazamine investigator and you have to submit the paper. We're still distributing clofazamine to uh, treating physician. 
if you use clofazin for non uh, leprosy, then you apply to directly to FDA. So it takes time to reach the uh, good level and anti-inflammatory anti uh, effect. Usually it's uh, six weeks if you have uh, 200. It, we're talking about four capsules a day. You have to take it with the, uh, the fat, otherwise you have GI symptoms and vomiting. We have only one case of ileus in one of the patients who was 70 years old. So it may happen, patient went to uh, laparotomy and the surgeon couldn't find the uh, problem uh, and the lymph nodes were black. And patient didn't tell, of course, anybody about leprosy and clofazimine. So it was after the surgery. So there is a new uh, warning on clofazamine because we treat older patients. And when you combine with clofazamine with other drugs, you might have QT prolongation. So actually it's recommended to use EKG before you start clofazamine. And I don't like clofazamine because uh, even in the drug inserts, it can cause suicide. Suicide is not medication. It, the look, how people look, especially like when you have young patient like this boy, you know, he was running away from the doctor. He didn't want to go to school because the way he looks and the boy wouldn't apply the makeup. Okay, they won't put the makeup like the girls. This gentleman uh, has a black nose. It's like everybody's asking the work, you know, what's happened to your nose? Who hit you, who hit you? And he said, oh, I just mowing the, uh, just mow the lawn. I said, what's going with your arms? Because it also causes photosensitivity not only darkening of the lesion, but also normal skin will get really dark. And this patient with blue eyes, you know, she developed uh, hyperpigmentation. I said, how do you deal with this? So she said, if somebody look at me, I'm just saying, why are you staring at me? So at this end of conversation, but not everybody can do this. So this is another, uh, I'm just showing you how people feel. So this is a uh, gentleman from Central America who ended up in a hospital with pancytopenia and, and extreme weakness. Because of pancytopenia, he got bone marrow biopsy and there was lots of bacilli. So he started treatment for leprosy. And then the ID physician comes for the consult and uh, who was from Africa said, this is not a TB, this is leprosy. And we changed medication to recommended clofazamine and then his cachexia has improved, but whenever it was invisible lesions here, now we can tattooing all the lesions on his body. When I ask him, open your mouth, please. Uh, I see also bacilli inside the bones. So this is the guy who is has lepromatous leprosy. He lost a juicy eyebrows and eyelashes. You don't see it well here and has disease all over, bone marrow, a liver, and he recovered. But he, uh, despite clofazamine, he was still having ENL, so he has to be on Talamid and he hated it. But the hope is on the horizon. So there is new agent, is PDE4 inhibitor. And actually uh, one of uh, the drug was tried and was the, uh, published by two Indian dermatologists. They used a Tesla in two patients with ENL and they published uh, the case. And since then, uh, we know the cell gene was acquired by Bristol uh, um, Myers Squibb and Amgen will be uh, doing clinical trials. Actually the clinical trials with these drugs are done in Nepal in leprosy hospital. And uh, there was a preliminary data about it works. They use only for one month. They hospitalized patients for one month because there was only way to just see follow up. But uh, soon uh, they will be looking for volunteers and the patients who would like to try it. So uh, there is organization, nonprofit organization in Australia who will be conducting uh, the trials in the nearest future. Now we're going to move to next complication. So the last complication um, and considered a reaction is called Lucio's phenomenon. It is exceedingly rare. Typically, these patients are Latin American. Um, we don't know 100% why. Um, it is mostly in Latin American patients, but we have some theories. Um, it is a vasculopathy. And 
what happens is the M. leprae and or M. lepromatosis bacilli infiltrate endothelial cells, um, then leading to ischemic necrosis and then necrosis of, of small blood vessels as well as edema. Um, those are findings that you can see histologically. A lot of these patients have high titers of cryoglobulins um, and also have positive antiphospholipid antibodies. So um, kind of tying it back to um, immune complexes and tying it back to this um, immune response. There may be an association with emlipromatosis. In fact, um, emlipromatosis was found post-mortem um, in several patients uh, who had Lucios. So this has been reported. Um, and a lot of authors do think that um, emlipromatosis is specifically more uh, associated with Lucios than emlepre, though emlepre can still cause them or lead to emlipromatosis. 50% of these people will will die though, because it is that dangerous and fatal if not treated early. So this is the clinical presentation of the patient who is young, 29 years old, and he ends up on Friday night, as always in a local emergency room. And the ER physician uh, calls you for the consult because patient is sick, is, uh, have also pancytopenia, and has those ulcers. So you also call the plastic surgeon and the surgeon try to examine and the skin just slides off and it leaks. I said, okay, this guy needs to go to OR for the debridement. And he examined him head to toe and you see the mainly lesions are on extremities, <clears throat> the fingers and the toes, but not only. When you see there's so much necrotic tissue, this guy goes to operating room every day for the breedment. And then he needs uh, artificial skin grafting that has changed the grafts. Eventually the patient uh, stays in ICU and I, I was in contact with him. I said, what is the progress? And so he sends me the progress. This is how the guy looks like. You can see a uh, kind of distended abdomen. He's hepatosplenomegaly. It's another guy who is infiltrates all over. The skin grafts already are placed here. So we're using this skin from abdomen for skin grafting for extremities. So abdomen has no skin lesions, nothing. This is just the donor site, but everything's on the legs and the arms getting blood transfusion. And initially, why I heard about this, because he's also treated for TB till nothing, uh, nothing was growing on the cultures and they call CDC, CDC call us, and this is how we get in touch with this patient. He's from the Los Angeles area. And he was referred to us because they couldn't heal this ulcer, no matter how many grafts, because patient has to be mobilized. And I examined him and uh, this is the scar, scar, and also the back was used as the donor site when he came to us. And this was his pathology. So um, just a side note, most of these patients who have Lucio's are actually untreated. They're undiagnosed. Um, so if you recall that patient at the beginning of our first lecture who had diffuse lepromatous le leprosy or leprosy bonita in which there was really no nodules, um, no overt evidence of, uh, of leprosy clinically, maybe the matterosis, but diffuse infiltration, all these patients walk around without knowing that they have leprosy. And then all of a sudden, um, if this, this reaction may occur, um, and then all of a sudden they're very, very sick. Um, when we take a biopsy, um, you will see diffuse uh, infiltration with, uh, with histiocytes, foamy histiocytes, as you would see in lepromatous leprosy. Um, you can also, when you go down to, um, to find some of these nerves, you're going to see fibrin thrombi within the, the, not the nerves, I'm sorry, the vessels. You'll see fibrin thrombi within the vessels. As you can see on the left, there are organisms within the thrombi. There are organisms also within the endothelium. So that's also very important when we're looking at these biopsies to make this diagnosis accurately. And then if we were to look, um, uh, look at this on EM, this is what the, what the vessels are gonna look like. This is what the endothelium, endothelial cell will look like. 
Um, but we are gonna have um, essentially elevated cryoglobulins and then this profound uh, injury to the endothelium, uh, which leads then to the fibrin thrombi um, and essentially death of the, of the cells. And we are heading to the end. So we have summary. So reactions. Um, often it's hard to tell which reaction we are dealing with. Also a reaction can overlap because swelling in extremities can present in type one and type two, similar like joint pain. Uh, if you don't know, uh, you can start the treatment with the prednisone and use immediately steroid sparing to avoid mega doses of steroids. If you have classic ENL or symptoms of ENL like other involvement, uveitis, previous orchitis, this tells you this patient already has intermittent ENL and it will be good to start ENL before we have all the cascade of events. So my main treatment actually is methotrexate and low dose prednisone. I don't use imiran or cyclosporin. I try this, it's very weak, it's not really working. So the Talamid is my uh, drug to go, number one. High dose clofazamine for, because of the uh, hyperpigmentation, I try to avoid. And uh, in the past uh, three years, I'm trying to use pulse therapy with three highly bactericidal antibiotic and use reaction early. Do not wait till you have full blown disease. And uh, this is again, uh, our contact information and we open for questions. Oh, uh, typed or just listening. I have a quick question about uh, ENL and treatment with thalidomide. Um, if you happen to have somebody on thalidomide, how do you differentiate the peripheral neuropathy from treatment with thalidomide from the peripheral neuropathy from Hansen's disease itself? Yeah. Right. This is on a, a drug insert. Patients are treating, asking the same question. This is why we check uh, nerve function initially, because our patient always have some degree of nerve injury. I haven't seen worsening with Talamid. I treated 160 patients with Talamid. I have only one patient who a week later told me, I won't take it. I think it make me sick and my hands feel different but majority of patients are finding relief. There is something that really works and have no side effects because this is a sleeping pill. People who are in pain and cannot sleep, they finally sleep and are having improvement. So another uh, option is to mitigate side effects uh, using combination of drugs. So I can use a little bit of methotrexate, a little bit of prednisone and thalamid because it's sedating. So if you use prescribed dose, to 200 or 150 people cannot function they have to, they want to work they want to have real life so if you use combination of drugs because we don't know what is different pathways so we cover with different medication different pathways and this is uh the best outcome using combination but uh this is a very good question because it's in drug insert you know it was used widely used in patients with uh hiv and people have neuropathy but hiv can cause neuropathy as well and our patient initially have neuropathy, but I haven't seen worsening. Thank you. Um, what dose of methotrexate do you use? So it's again, um, it depends uh, on the uh, age of the patient. You as dermatologist using methotrexate, uh, so you know about the side effects and recommendations. Uh, I don't, I tend not go higher than the 15 milligrams, one, five milligrams weekly. Uh, older patient may do well on 10 milligrams weekly. The same like younger people, if they don't drink, you know, I don't trust, you know, uh, young males, they tell me they don't drink. So I check uh, the liver, you know, because even though they tell me they don't drink, but still I don't go higher than 15. Occasionally I have to go with injectable uh, 20 if they have GI uh, effect, but I'm splitting the dose, so it's better tolerated. So this is my experience.
And uh, if you if somebody has questions later on, we don't have to answer right now. Uh, you can send us an email with the questions. And if you need more materials uh, about the skin smears, uh, we have about uh, nerve testing. We have very good educational short videos and we can send to you. And also once a year we have today's seminar, at least we used to, we don't have uh, current uh, agenda because we're still in the COVID uh, era, era, but hopefully we will let you know if somebody wants to spend two days with us because we can see the patients, you can listen to the basic science, which is fascinating armadillo stories, etc., and testing. So uh, you are all invited. Barbara, um, Dr. Motoparty had a really good question, and I think both of us can probably answer it. He asked, um, can you provide some pointers about using bacterial index in combination with clinical appearance to arrive at the final Ridley dropping classification? I think that's a really good question because a lot of times we are, I mean, we're putting a lot of pieces together using the clinical presentation, we're using the histologic features, the architecture of the lesions, the, um, you know, the amount of organisms that we see, and then the PCR findings, um, all of that kind of plays a role. And so when you have a patient that is, has, has more than, I think you look at the WHO criteria, they have the five cutoff, the fewer than five lesions and greater than five lesions, it's a little bit confusing, but I think that if you have more lesions, you biopsy it, it's loaded with bacilli, you can be, and, and the, the, the histologic features are disorganized, foamy histiocytes everywhere. Um, there's no granulomas to find. There's intraneural bacilli, bacilli everywhere. You can be confident that you're on the lepromi descent of the spectrum. Um, again, going back to that visual that I had, you go looking along the spectrum from organization to disorganization, and then correlating that with bacterial index um, is, is for me the most helpful, but clinical absolutely plays a role. You know, we are talking about a, a patient I saw on the Zoom. So the patient almost looked like BL, large lesions and many of them but mainly in extremities, but he saw pathology and looks like few bacilli. So there was the question, you know, is this BT or BL or maybe BB? Because patient is already immunologically very unstable with severe reactions. So he almost fits in the middle of the spectrum. And like we always want to have clear answer, and like in medicine, we don't have clear answers. So when in doubt, treat as multibacillary, when in doubt. That's a really, really good point. I think it's, if you see, so histologically, say you see a little more than few <laughs> and it's a little bit more disorganized than you would typically see in tuberculoid and say they have more than five lesions, I think you can probably put them in the mid borderline or greater spectrum so that they're treated with three drugs for a longer period of time. Because there was the reason for WHO to come up with three drugs for shorter period of time and for longer period of time. You know, this is approach one size fits all. And I think it's complicated. So we try to do custom treatment for our patients. Any more questions? Scott? Okay, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. That was really enlightening. And uh, we'd like to make the video available to you if you would like to get that. Please contact us here at the National Disease Program and we can make sure that we get that. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, I hope that if you need assistance in the future that you will contact us and let us know, and we're always glad to help. Uh, patients are number one. Okay, we're going to start. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was awesome. Okay, bye. Bye, good luck. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you so much.